Uh, welcome back to Fertility Factor Fiction. Great to have you guys all back. This is our weekly show where we dispel all the myths, reveal all the truths, and share with you all of the information you want to know about your fertility journey and everything that's happening there. We uh, are really excited to have you all back. Interesting topic tonight. We're going to be talking about embryo glue. We got a lot of questions about this, and so we wanted to make sure we were able to answer everyone's questions. So we're gonna give everybody some time to log on and uh, we will be with you shortly. Welcome to Fertility Factor Fiction. Hope that you guys have had a good week. I know uh, some of you in certain communities are back into a bit of a lockdown. And so uh, we certainly respect the difficulty that poses. Fertility centers are still open and doing fine. Um, and we are open uh, as well. Um, I'll announce this several times through the show, but Windsor is now fully functional for IVF. We can do our egg retrievals here. We can do our transfers, which we've already been doing. And we have uh, full ability to manage everything else that we need to manage. So uh, we're very, very excited to have uh, that opportunity. Finally, first time ever in Windsor and uh, an amazing thing for the community and for us. I want to thank all of my teammates who helped us make that uh come true and uh, we are super excited to have everybody uh, contribute to that amazing project. So thank you to the ladies who uh, contributed to that, including the littlest lady, uh, Miss uh, Victory Jr. there, who is currently uh, out of uh, the continent studying and she helped us out tremendously as well, did a lot of the work in putting together our manual. Um, and uh, so uh, a lot of uh, thanks to her for uh, all the work that she did. So Jenny, I love you and uh, uh, thank you for all your efforts on, on our behalf. Uh, so we uh, have a pretty cool topic tonight. Uh, a lot of people always want to know about what sort of extra treatments are important when they're doing IVF. And they want to know what uh, kind of things they can do to improve their chances. So in order to figure that out, we decided that we would explore the various ones and we've done that. We've looked at natural treatments, uh, vitamin supplements. We've looked at uh, you know the time lapse that we looked at previously. I've discussed HCG wash. And so there've been a bunch of adjuncts we've looked at and some actually have a benefit such as the use of HCG wash and some don't like the time lapse. And so what we wanted to look at now was whether or not embryo glue was valuable as an addition to your IVF journey, because some people really think it works and others don't. My own knowledge of this topic was that uh, the majority of the studies that have been done are either equivocal or they showed a benefit, but they were not really convincing in the manner in which the study was conducted. And so we didn't have a large enough body of literature to support a decision saying, yes, let's go ahead and aim for doing the embryo glue. And it can be fairly pricey. Uh, so I know in certain centers, they'll charge upwards of five or $600 to do this. And so the question was, is this beneficial or not? And keep in mind that there are two places where you can use hyaluronic acid, which is what embryo glue is made of. Uh, one is in the culture media when you are growing the embryo. And the other one is in the uh, actual catheter when you're doing the embryo transfer. So we really wanted to explore whether or not that would be helpful for you guys when you're trying to do this. And so uh, the point of tonight's talk was to determine if that was helpful or not. So this is actually gonna be relatively brief because there isn't a ton of info here to share, um, not loads and loads of different topics uh, that most studies go through. It's really compact, it's all kind of on one page. So the uh, study looked at 26 articles that they included for review, and they then went through it and they analyzed a total of 6,000 and I believe 76 patients altogether. So fairly high number uh, of patients, or sorry, 6,704 patients altogether. Uh, so fairly large, robust data set for which which they had information from. So they looked at several different outcomes. They wanted to look at the chances of live birth. So that's really critical, obviously. They wanted to look at miscarriage rates. They wanted to look at whether or not the clinical pregnancy rate was different. They wanted to look at whether the multiple pregnancy rate was different. And then they also wanted to look at adverse events, which they included 
things like ectopic pregnancies and reactions and various problems. So um, the reality was that when they explored this, they explored it in terms of adding to the media and they also looked at it in terms of the, uh, adding it to the catheter when you do the actual transfer. So when you look at the live birth rate data, they said that there was a 21% increase in live birth rate, and this was statistically significant. So this is important because previous studies done individually really did not support the use of embryo glue, but this one where they're combining all of these different studies together and reanalyzing it actually does show a significant benefit. So that's pretty incredible news, very valuable information. And you're talking about a live birth rate, which is our sort of you know, brass ring or gold ring that we're reaching for. We always want to see that the live birth rates are increasing because that's the critical element that is most important for patients. So uh, they did show that that was good. And when they graded the evidence, which is really important when you're doing a meta-analysis like that, they actually said it was moderate. So that's a significant benefit to this study in that they're saying this is pretty decent data contributing to the answer and the answer is that for live birth, you have a 21% increase if there's embryo glue added. When they looked at the miscarriage rate, they did show a decrease, 18% lower with embryo glue, but it was not statistically significant. It sat right on the border of statistical significance. When they analyze stats, not to bore anybody out there, but they look at something called confidence intervals or confidence limits which means just how sure are we of the answer? What's the range of possibility that this answer could be true? And if that crosses the number one, then it's not significant. So if you have like 0.8 to 1.5, it just means it's not significant. But if it's 0.8 to 0.9, it means you have anywhere from a 10 to 20% decrease. And if it's 1.2 to 1.3, it means 20 to 30% increase. So this one was from 0.67 to 1. So it's right on that line. My suspicion is if they had greater numbers, they'd actually see a significance there. And it's certainly a pretty strong trend. Unfortunately, they did look, uh, grade the data as being low level for quality of evidence. So we're not 100% sure on miscarriage. Then they looked at the clinical pregnancy rate. So this is also seeing the heartbeat. And they saw a 16% increase, which was, again, statistically significant and, again, moderate level data or quality of data. So, again, that's a robust answer with a pretty tangible significant increase in the chances of success. Multiple pregnancy rates. So if you're going to use the embryo glue and you're putting in more than one embryo, 45% increase. So that is huge and means you do need to be very, very careful. So in particular, if you're putting in embryos that are genetically tested, you're using embryo glue, you have an extraordinarily high chance of ending up with twins. While everybody thinks they're really cute and cuddly, keep in mind that twins have enormous risks. Uh, some you know, people will go on to deliver early. They may run into complications, hospitalization, high blood pressure, diabetes. Uh, weight gain, edema, um, needing to be on bed rest for prolonged periods of time, or even hospitalization for prolonged periods of time. So all of these are very significant factors that you need to consider and uh, incorporate into your calculus when you're deciding if this makes sense or not for you. So multiple pregnancy rate very significantly increased. Again, data quality moderate, so very helpful information to know because they basically go low, moderate, high. So this is pretty robust data. The adverse event rate, looking at things like ectopics and complications, was 0.86, so suggesting a 14% decrease. However, it was not statistically significant at all. It went from 0.4 to 1.84. So as I mentioned earlier, if it crosses the 1, then that's really not that helpful. So what they concluded with was that embryo transfer solutions containing high concentrations of hyaluronic acid or embryo glue, increases the number of live births in IVF and ICSI. Transfer solutions containing high concentrations of hyaluronic acid may slightly decrease the risk of miscarriage. So overall, what they're saying is that this is very valid and that it looks like it does actually improve the success rates. So then you might say, well, how sure are we of the data? So they themselves answered that. They said, we are moderately confident about our results. 
for the numbers of live births, clinical pregnancies, and multiple pregnancies. Our results may change if further evidence becomes available. They always put that in there because they don't want to say that this is the be all and end all. Somebody may present a new study with new data. And if they do, you need to be ready to incorporate that data into the questions and answers so that you can actually go through it all again and reanalyze and decide if it really makes sense. They do say they are less confident about the miscarriage rate and the number of adverse events because these results varied widely and that's why the data was sort of lower quality there and they weren't quite as sure. So it may reduce your miscarriage rates, it may not, but it does look like it increases live birth, it increases your clinical pregnancy and it significantly increases your chances of multiple pregnancy. So why is this important? Well, if you're gonna be doing an IVF cycle, you wanna maximize your chances. And so a lot of patients have asked us about this. And in the past, I did shy away from using it. I am changing my mind now based on this because this is a Cochrane Library meta-analysis. They do very good meta-analyses. They have no financial investment into the things they're studying. It's an independent body that just analyzes all sorts of different topics in medicine. And so this is suggesting that this may be beneficial. So it may be worthwhile to include this kind of automatically into all of our embryo transfers. The cost is the major issue. We are reaching out to the folks that market this to see how much it would be if we're using it on a sort of broader scale. But I know that in at least one of the clinics that I work in, um, the cost is substantial. It's a significant increase to the cost of doing the procedure, especially if you're doing an embryo transfer. It's quite pricey to add this in there. And because of that, we need to factor that in because what could be a fairly expensive procedure to begin with can become really quite expensive by the time you add in the meds and you're adding in the embryo glue and the monitoring and the transfer. Now you're talking substantial figures, you know, somewhere between $1,500 to $2,500. So that's that's pretty pricey depending on where you're going and what you're doing. So uh, I think that this is amazing data. So is it a fact or a fiction that Embryo Glue works? It appears that it is a fact that Embryo Glue does work. And so we're really excited about that because I love finding new things that we can do to help you guys out. And this data is constantly evolving and we're always finding new things that we can incorporate to try and make it better. And I'll never quit doing that. Every week we're out there hunting for new things to share with you guys because we want to make sure that we are providing you with the absolute best information so that you can attain the best results possible and we can do that for you. So uh, definitely make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, especially on our YouTube channel where you can find all of our videos that we do, all of our weekly shows are there. We've got over 10,000 views on several of our videos. They're really informative. We hope you enjoy them. It's www.youtube.com forward slash drvictorydrvictory.com. So try that out and uh, have a look. You can also find our videos through our website. So that's just www.drvictory.com, drvictory.com. So if there's uh, anything you want to know, don't hesitate. Reach out to us. We're always there to uh, help you out. And uh, we hope that uh, you guys will consider using this in the future. We will make it available for the patients that want it. And we will probably start recommending it to patients that uh, are interested in using it. So that's it for the uh, fact or fiction part of the show. We always take live questions. And that's probably my favorite part of the show because uh, we get to reach out directly to people and help them out. Um, I just want to remind those of you who jumped on a little bit later that uh, Windsor now is fully operational. We can now do our embryo transfers here. We can do egg retrievals here. We're going to be doing surgery here soon. Uh, I'm very excited about the fact that we can do some of our surgeries here because as you all know, in Canada right now, surgery is massively backed up. Uh, and so we are very much excited about the fact that we will be able to help out our patients by uh, offering them services here in the clinic, which is amazing. Um, we're just going to be trialing out some equipment. So uh, thanks to all of those of you who are uh, sending thumbs up, uh, lots of likes and, uh, and hearts for that. That's a, a really amazing opportunity for us to provide help to people um, who otherwise would be waiting six months for a year. And we can do it locally. Uh, I'm also really excited because our air purification system here in our clinic is beyond reproach. Um, the amazing Wendy Victory has taken every step humanly possible to make sure you are getting the most COVID-free air possible in here. 
We have all sorts of systems and backup systems to purify the air. We've not had a single person sick in here since the start of the pandemic. Um, and I've actually not even had a, a sniffle or anything for uh, the whole year, which is unusual. Usually, at least somebody walks away with a cold. Everybody's done great so far. And I think it's because of how clean the air is. So for people that want to come here from other communities, it's a great place to be because we don't have to worry about contamination from anything. It's super, super clean. Again, my amazing team. Thank you. They've all done an amazing job uh, uh, running the place uh, spick and span and uh, making sure we're providing the very safest and best care we possibly can. Okay, so questions. Uh, we've got Shannon on um, Facebook. So good evening, Dr. Victory. Good evening. What are your thoughts on Recovel? Why or why not? Would you prescribe to your patients Recovel during STEM? So um, Recovel is a very interesting drug for those of you that uh, are not familiar with it. So Recovel is a recombinant uh, FSH product produced by Faring. And the product essentially is very different from other products that are available because most recombinant products, which means they basically teach a specific cell type to produce it, uh, are done in hamster cells. And so they train the hamster cells to produce a human protein. We've talked about this on other shows, but I'll bring it back to your attention. Any kind of protein, steroid, anything you make in your body, you frequently will glycosylate, which means little bits of sugar get stuck to the protein in different places. And that does impact the way that it functions in your body. So the way a hamster cell is going to glycosylate something is the way it would do it if you were a hamster. Clearly, we're not dealing with hamsters, so a human glycosylation would be different. So Recavel is the first and only product that is made in a human cell line. So uh, IVF specialists are generally pretty reluctant to change things because of the fact that we know what works well and we don't want to mess with success. So it's been kind of slow to be adopted, but I will tell you in my own personal experience that the patients that are using Recavel seem to have a very robust response and we do get very good embryo quality from those cycles. Is it drastically better than using any other product? No, I believe in general, they're all fairly equivalent, but we are starting to use it a little bit more in our patients who are poor responders and we do seem to be getting a pretty good, robust response from them. Are you gonna go from making two or three eggs to making 10? No, you are not. So don't put uh, your eggs all in one basket, so to speak, in that regard, because it's not gonna do that for you. But is it gonna improve maybe going from three to four or five eggs? It may, and does it improve the quality of the embryos? Their own studies did not show that, and they did compare it directly head to head with GONALF. But uh, I'm seeing pretty good embryo quality, so I'm at least happy enough to say that it is as good as what we were getting before. Maybe we're seeing an improvement. That may just be related to the fact that we are seeing it in conjunction with the fact that we're doing it with Menopure and Recavel together. And that seems to be giving us really good results. Um, and we also are focusing on a ratio of your recombinant to your urinary, which is the Recavel or Gonalef 2 Menopure, which a British study previously showed maximized the chances that the embryo would be genetically normal. So we're really taking every step we possibly can to make sure that we're giving you guys the very best chance. So that's why I would recommend it. If you have kind of weaker ovaries, if you have a diminished ovarian reserve, if we think you can make three or four, those are the patients where we are trying out the Recavel to see if it works. I do love my Gonalef. Um, Serono is a great company. Um, we do get great support from them. Nothing wrong with Fearing. We love them too. So I tend to mix and match, and we use both actually frequently in almost all of our cycles. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Nikki Bishop. Is there any other reason an HCG level would be positive of 5.7 other than pregnancy? Could it still be from post-pregnancy of nine weeks? So 5.7 is very close to the limit of detection of five. And I would assume that that's actually not really positive. That's probably within the margin of lab error. Um, and you can naturally have either cross signaling with other hormones that share 
one of the subunits of HCG, the alpha subunit. Um, and even if you don't, uh, there are patients that actually produce HCG in small quantities in their bloodstream, even when they're not pregnant. So that could be why it's happening. Uh, Tarek has some YouTube questions he wants to ask us. Did you have those there or do you have to get them off of this? I'd have to get them off of this. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll ask another one from YouTube. Uh, good evening. I mean, from Facebook. Uh, is there something I can do and take to help with implantation? I keep miscarrying between five and six weeks. Oh, I'm so sorry. My husband and I have been tested for chromosomes, karyotype, and it came back completely normal. So, um, Jill... Uh, there are lots of things you can do to help with maintaining your pregnancy. Uh, so recurrent uh, pregnancy loss, which is what you're actually uh, facing, has nothing to do with your implantation. Your implanting is just not staying implanted. So in order to keep it implanted, you need to do all of the steps uh, that we normally do to explore what's wrong. So it could be infectious, that could be at your cervix or inside your uterus. So cervix is easy, it's just a swab for urea plasma and mycoplasma. Inside your uterus, we're using Fertilisys. I just had a fantastic conversation with the doctor from Fertilisys. We're actually gonna be doing research together to explore how some of the things they believe work actually work. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, so Fertilisys can test you for your bacteria and viruses in the lining of your uterus. We look for your genetics, which you've obviously already done. You also, if you're having recurrent miscarriages, need to do the PGT. PGT is not useful for everybody, but in this instance, it actually can be beneficial. You wanna make sure that your embryos are normal. You may have genetically normal uh, karyotype, but the embryo may not. So that's really critical for you. Then the next thing we look for is whether or not your hormones are normal. We check your thyroid in particular to make sure you don't have thyroid antibodies. You wanna make sure all of your vitamin levels are up high enough, including iron. Your vitamin D is really critical for miscarriage risk. Make sure there's no smoking, drinking, or drug use, including marijuana in either you or your partner. If your partner's using marijuana, it's a 250% increase in the risk of miscarriage. So that's critical as well. We look for thrombophilia, where your blood may clot more easily than it's supposed to. And then we also look for potentially immune-related causes. I use my amazing colleagues, Fred uh, uh, Zaneku and Chloe Remain uh, in Toronto for the immune workups. And they actually run some of their testing through Fertilisys. So uh, they do an incredible job. And if we think it's immune, there are some treatments for you that can be very, very beneficial. So that's a, a good opportunity for you too. I'm just leaning forward so I can start answering some of the questions from Instagram. So uh, let's see what people wanted to know. Uh, here we go. Are you doing retrievals at your Windsor Clinic yet? Yes. So we answered that already. Um, and it, will it be an issue if we're interested in a fresh transfer? So that's a great question. So yes, we are now doing retrievals in Windsor. And it's not an issue if you want to do a fresh transfer, but keep in mind the fresh transfer is not necessarily ideal. And we've reviewed that on the show in several videos now, including one just, was it last week or the week before? I think it was last week. Last week, yeah. So we looked at the safety of pregnancy last week uh, when you're doing fresh versus frozen, and frozen is safer. So fresh transfers are useful if you and beneficial if you don't have very many embryos at all and or your estrogen levels stay very low. But if you have a lot of embryos to use or your estrogen levels got high, a fresh transfer is actually not beneficial because it decreases your success rates, probably increases your miscarriage rates and does make for a more complicated pregnancy potentially. So frozen embryo transfers are probably safer in that regard. But yeah, we can do them if you want the fresh, it's not a problem. We are happy to oblige. And you know, we always work with you to, to talk to you. Does Viagra have any negative effects on sperm quality when trying to conceive naturally or through IUI? Uh, so that has been looked at, and I don't believe anyone has ever shown that Viagra has any negative side effects on sperm quality. If anything, it may actually be an improvement. And we do use Viagra in women when they have problems with recurrent implantation failure or issues with thickening their lining. And Viagra actually has some impact on 
uh, tamping down your immune responsiveness. So if your immune system is overactive in a male or a female, it may be beneficial in that regard. And the less antibodies, the less natural killer cells, macrophages, and so on that are there within reason, especially the overwhelming ones or overpowered ones, the better off you will do. So Viagra is likely beneficial and definitely not harmful as far as we know. And Anya Music says she loves this. Well, thank you. We love you too. Um, okay. Are there any vitamins you should absolutely stop after embryo transfer? Melatonin, R lipic, and acetylcysteine, vitamin C. No, you can stay on all of those. I'm not sure about R lipic, um, but everything else is. Uh, oh, I think you mean alpha lipoic acid. Um, so I'm not sure about alpha lipoic acid, but the rest of them are perfectly fine to continue. You don't have to stop them. And there are no vitamins you need to stop when you uh, are trying to conceive. When using vaginal suppo suppositories, does it matter if you insert yourself or use an applicator? How do you know if you're getting up in the right spot? Okay, great question. Fantastic question. So progesterone is always delivered into the vagina with a vehicle. So what I mean by that is not that you're driving a car into your vagina, but rather that there is something carrying the progesterone and that vehicle is usually the gel or the gooey stuff that comes out. Or if you're using entometrin, it feels like fizz pop and you get this gush of fluid. So all of that is designed to deliver the progesterone the progesterone is actually being absorbed by the walls of the vagina, which are extremely vascular. And so it doesn't actually matter very much where you absorb it. So you can get it in a little or you can get it in a lot, it's gonna do the same thing. We like it a little bit higher just because we think in our heads, it's actually maybe going into the uterus, but it really isn't. If you think of the system of blood flow, it's not probably going into the uterus directly. It's still circulating through your system. There may be some that's going directly in, but it's probably fairly minimal. So are you comfortable using your fingers? Use your fingers. If you're comfortable using an applicator, use an applicator. Do not try and stick it up by your tonsils. That's unnecessary, guys. So gentle, gentle is always good. Low stress is definitely very, very important. So, um, you know, we don't want to go crazy. Uh, let's get back to Facebook. Glenda, I'm 38, healthy, healthy BMI, five frozen embryos. First embryo took, miscarried at seven weeks. Two embryo, second embryo, I guess, was chemical. Protocol was oral esterase, progesterone suppositories, aspirin. My friend wants to add PIO and prednisone. Would you do this? Any other things, intralipids? So Glenda, I would first figure out why you've had the miscarriage um, and then the chemical. So I wouldn't jump into it. At 38, PGT testing is probably indicated. So most likely the problem is genetic. Um, if your embryos were PGT tested, that's fine. Then that's a different story. You should be exploring why you're having the recurrent miscarriages. But if your embryos weren't PGT tested, you may need nothing. Having said that, aspirin for sure, we definitely use PIO. It has been proven to be better um, with, the with the progesterone suppositories vaginally as well. Um, prednisone is reasonable. Most studies say it's questionable, but there are some and we've reviewed them on previous videos that suggests that it can be beneficial in some cases. So we do use prednisone for the cases where they've had failures. Um, other things, potentially antibiotics, probiotics, that kind of thing. But make sure you're getting investigated before you invest into putting any more embryos inside you. It is not okay to just keep putting embryos in without figuring out what's wrong. And I've advocated for that many, many times. Can you do the isthmusial surgery at the clinic? or needs to be done at the hospital. Uh, the isthmusial surgery, we may be able to do at the clinic, Kelly. Um, it would be tough, but it's possible. Depends on how significant your isthmusial is. And I uh, don't wanna get into your personal details online, but that's something you can call and we can chat about. Um, okay, uh, another question. I know you've mentioned this in previous Factor Fiction videos, but what is a good brand for Myo and Ocetol? Um, any brand is probably fine. We like uh, Yad, and I know that Dr. Strong likes uh, NFH. So any of those are fine. Um, I'm good with either. I don't 
sort of promote anything. I don't get paid for any of these videos. Um, I don't have any ties to any companies that, you know, gives me a, a benefit for promoting one versus another, um, nor will I ever do that. So we are happy using any product that is good. Um, and I don't really think that there's any head-to-head -head comparison saying this inositol is better than that inositol. So you're probably good either way. Um, okay. Thoughts on post-implantation tips, superstitions, pineapples, fries, et cetera. Any science behind these? Um, okay, so we've reviewed this on previous shows. So sex is good. Apparently increases your success rate. Just don't go crazy, no 50 shades of gray. Um, so you wanna be fairly gentle, but intercourse is probably beneficial. Um, whatever stresses you the least is really good. So if chilling out at home is good, chill out at home. If going to work is good, go to work. Um, uh, make sure your vitamins are all high and then no extremes. So, you know, you don't want to be having anything too sweet, too cholesterol, too sugary, too, you know, salty, too spicy, just like, you know, everything should be kind of balanced. Um, you know, it's not that eating something spicy is bad. If eating something spicy was bad, we wouldn't have countries that predominantly have spicy foods and have billions of people in them. So it's not that, but just kind of, stay at like a level reasonable steady state for yourself wherever that is and whatever you're comfortable with do but if it's stressing you don't do it um i would say a little bit of meditation is helpful prayer actually has been proven to be helpful so if you're religious like i am that's definitely a good thing get a prayer circle going reach out to any of our uh, 6,000 plus followers now, I'm sure they'll be happy to contribute. And maybe we should do that on a regular basis. We can have a prayer minute once a week for all the folks that are going through uh, through fertility treatment and, and it will potentially have a beneficial effect. So anything like that can be helpful. Whatever is gonna make you relax will definitely help you. Whatever stresses you has been proven to be detrimental. Can you explain more about immunoglobulin SC injections? Sure. Um, although I should have Fred and Chloe on the show for this one. So um, immunoglobulin therapy is where we administer kind of blind, random immunoglobulins into you to try and bind up any antigens or antibodies in your bloodstream that could be negative or causing problems with your fertility. So the traditional studies have been done on a product called IVIG, which just means intravenous immune globulin. And IVIG is insanely expensive. So I had a lovely patient come here who was actually getting treatment in the state. She came here all the way from Ireland uh, and she wanted therapy for assistance with her cycle in the States. She wanted IVIG, money was not an issue. It was $5,300 for one treatment. Like it is just insanely expensive. Um, and that was me doing it at cost for her. So it was crazy, just absolutely crazy expensive. Subcutaneous IG is uh, currently free. So it is not expensive. And so it doesn't have the same data set available to prove that it works but we are seeing some benefits in people we've used it in. So I am becoming a believer. Um, it's just very slow uptake and we are cherry picking who we use it on because if we start using it on everybody, the government will shut it down. So we need to be cautious, um, but we are being judicious in who we use it for people that genuinely seem to have an immune problem or are tested positive and seem to have an immune problem. So that's what subcutaneous is. Now, how is it done? You basically insert a catheter into your fat and it drips in there. Um, it can be kind of tingly and uncomfortable, but it's not terrible. Um, it takes a long time and uh, they set it up with a whole infusion pump um, and they teach you how to do everything and it, it actually works really reasonably. So uh, considering it's free and it's easy to do, I kind of love uh, using that for the patients that need it. So hopefully that explains uh, subcutaneous IG. How many hours of sleep do I get? I swear doctors never sleep. Uh, I got about two and a half hours last night. So I was on call before I uh, came here today and worked all day. Um, I kind of feel like I'm missing out on opportunities to do things when I'm sleeping. So average for me is about four and a half, five hours a night, maybe a little bit more sometimes. Um, never really more than six hours. That would be like a, a long night. So um, usually not sleeping too much. 
Now that I'm old and I snore, I probably sleep even less than I used to. Um, hi, Dr. Victory. Thank you for doing those videos. Very informative. My question is, I have an ovarian cyst on my left ovary. Does that affect fertility and should I remove it? Uh, you should remove it if the cyst is large, um, is something that would interfere while you're pregnant, or is not allowing your other eggs to grow. Examples would be a dermoid or a large endometrioma. Um, if it's just going to pop and go away, it's a simple cyst. I would leave that alone and just wait unless age is a significant factor. Okay. Um, my partner had a successful frozen transfer at our second beta on 19 days post five day progesterone was 15 animals. Is this level okay? Yeah, that's fine. No problem with that level. That's a good level. Uh, best FET protocol for endo patients. My clinic suggests Lupron only. Why do you suggest Lupron and Letrozole? Because there was a head-to-head -head study, Kate. Uh, sorry, it says Destiny, Kate. So head-to-head -head study compared Lupron to Lupron plus Letrozole, and the patients with Lupron and Letrozole did better. That's going back a while in our video series, but it is on our YouTube channel. You can find it there. You have to search around and probably watch a couple hundred videos in there now, but um, it is there. There's a head-to-head -head study and it did examine that and uh, they showed that the letrozole with Lupron was better. So we do recommend you use both. Um, if you think about it, Lupron alone decreases your estrogen levels quite a lot, but Lupron with Letrozole really decreases your estrogen levels because you're basically turning it off completely. So the more you turn off the estrogen, the more suppression you're getting of your endo. Suppressing endo is the goal. So you want to maximize that suppressive effect. So three to six months is what they showed. Mary Lou, stressed. Mary Lou, do not be stressed. We have everything under control. Uh, Adriana Ford or Adrena, Andrina Ford. Hi, Dr. Victory, big fan, thank you. Uh, 32, four centimeter endometrioma, same size couple, no lining issues, clear sono, two failed IUI with donor sperm, IVF with new donor, nine retrieved, six non-PGS tested blasts, awesome. Failed fresh, you should never have done a fresh, and two FET, last protocol, estradiol patch, PIO, prednisone, fragment, medrol, embryo glue, HCG wash. When do you start looking at more investigative testing? Or do I just keep going along with FETs and hope for the best? No, you need surgery. For sure you need surgery. And you need Lupron and Letrozole. So that's a no-brainer. Endo, okay, so if you have endometriosis, it never makes sense to do a fresh embryo transfer. It's actually completely contradictory. You have your highest estrogen levels in your body when you're doing a fresh IVF cycle. So when you hit the point where they're triggering you, you're at your maximum estrogen level. You are all guns blazing as far as your estrogen level is concerned. For endometriosis, you have literally not just dumped, but like fire hosed, you know, gasoline onto the fire. It just makes absolutely no sense to then go and try and do an embryo transfer into that environment. It is supercharged with your immune system trying to quell the endometriosis. So fresh transfer with endo, it just doesn't make any sense at all. You need to do, if you have a four centimeter endometrioma, I would definitely argue you should have that removed. You need surgical treatment of your endo, and then you should do three months of letrozole and Lupron to shut everything down. I apologize, it will make you feel terrible, but it will improve your chances. You may even need more than three months. That's really critical to maximize your chances. You should also be taking turmeric, NAC, inositol. Um, all of those have been shown to be beneficial potentially for patients with endo um, and get that endo suppressed as much as possible. I would advise seeing a naturopath. Um, make sure you are taking a low sort of estrogen stimulating diet. And the more you do to quell your endo, the better off you will do. But for sure, you need surgery. Get rid of all the endo in there. Um, I don't know where you are, but if you're in Canada, see a real specialist, not just any gynecologist. You have to see someone who's gonna protect your ovary. And if you are in the States, please, please, please only go to an AAGL trained specialist. Not everybody is capable of doing this properly. You gotta make sure they know you're going through fertility, that you wanna preserve the function of your ovary. Only someone from the AAGL, which is American Association of Gynecologic Laparoscopists, 
will know how. And when I say from the AAGL, I mean they've been fellowship trained in an AAGL, minimally invasive gynecologic surgery fellowship. Critical. This is not something that every surgeon can do. I have seen loads of people with injuries, horrible outcomes, needs for bowel resection, colostomies, all sorts of damage to the ovary from multiple different countries. So please be very careful if you are getting that kind of surgery done. You have to find a good surgeon. Can you exercise while doing injections for IVF? Are you the one that administers IUI and IVF? <clears throat> okay, answer to your first question. Yes, you can exercise, but don't go crazy. You don't wanna be taking the blood flow you've injected um, your medication into indirectly granted because it goes into your fat, but it's absorbed into your bloodstream and then have it circulating like crazy through your muscle. You want it going to your ovaries, so don't overdo it if you're exercising just enough to keep you sort of stable. It, do I do IUI? No. So we don't have any benefit to me doing IUI. I only do the cases where the girls can't get in because IUI is very simple and realistically anybody can do it. Um, and God bless my ladies, they all have excellent success rates. So um, it doesn't make a difference if you get me. If you're talking about the IVF, yes, I do the IVF. So I do your egg retrieval, I do your embryo transfer. Um, our amazing colleague, Dr. Pattinson, is doing them slowly as well. So he's here also, but it's going to be me doing my transfers and, and my retrievals. So you get me from start to finish. Hello from Winnipeg. Hello. Um, it's Winterpeg. Uh, I am wondering what your thoughts are on trying uh, GCSF after two failed transfers. Yeah. So granulocyte colony stimulating factor is uh, potentially beneficial. There are some studies that show a benefit. The last time we reviewed this, and it was a few months back on the adjunct therapies that work for an FET, uh, it did suggest that there may be a benefit. They're not sure. It's certainly not gonna hurt. Again, if you've already had two previous failed transfers, my question is, why are you failing your transfers? So I would spend the time to explore the reason why you're failing before you start adding in these adjunct treatments. So before we start spending money on treatments that we're not really ever 100% sure on, I would wanna know why is it not working? Is it a genetic problem? Is it an infectious problem? All the things we reviewed earlier in the show. Great news about retrieval in Windsor, yes. My question is, can I keep on a ketogenic diet throughout IVF cycle? Um, yeah, nobody's answered that, but as long as you're not like severely ketogenic, it's probably okay. If you're fully ketogenic, that's probably a pretty imbalanced diet. I wouldn't recommend that. Abnormal BCL6 on Receptiva DX test, oh God. Other tests normal, first FET failed. Next step, 60 days of Zolodex. AMH 0.4. Two PGT embryos, do these results lower chances at a live birth? What else can help? Okay, so if you have two normal PGT embryos, you have a very robust chance of success, so congratulations. The BCL6 thing is useless, ignore it. Receptiva DX has um, not been shown to be clinically useful, so I would ignore that test completely. It is not helpful. Um, there is no evidence that supports the use of Receptiva DX. In fact, uh, if you look at that study, just recently we reviewed by Dr. Richard Scott and his associates, they showed that if you do have three genetically normal embryos with absolutely no other treatments, so no special embryo glue, no intralipids, nothing, just three repeated Frozen embryo transfers with nothing, just garden variety treatment, they had a 95.2% live birth rate, guys. So that's a video we have from just a few weeks back. Hugely important study, hugely important. So very critical to know that if you have normal embryos, you have a very, very high chance of success. And even more important from my perspective, you don't even need to know that you have genetically normal embryos because PGT doesn't necessarily help. So the, the answer is, if you have enough embryos, you're gonna get pregnant and have a baby eventually. Um, is that true for everybody? No, there is that roughly 5% that don't, but overall, a huge number of people will do very, very well if they have in their pool of embryos, genetically normal embryos. So that's critical to remember. Everybody's got a shot, guys. 
You just need to get to the right spot. Can I try IUI with the med that you mentioned? Um, if you mean Recovel, yeah, absolutely. You can do uh, Recovel. I'm not sure which med you mean, this Nesreen, so you'd have to specify. Whoops. I'm starting to type on your thing, Tarek. That was a mistake. <laughs> um, can a 1 to 80 ANA level lead to recurrent miscarriage? I have unexplained infertility. And I've had four miscarriages between five to six weeks. Oh, wow. That's Aaron's. Uh, Aaron Chember. Aaron, I'm so sorry you're going through that. That's awful. Um, you need to get in touch with Fred and Chloe or me, and we need to investigate why you have that. But yes, uh, anti-nuclear antibodies are part of autoimmune problems, and those patients do have a harder time staying pregnant. Um, we definitely use things to try and quell that. So that's where your subcutaneous Ig might be helpful, the steroids, intralipids, heparin, aspirin, um, we use a lot of different therapies for people that have immunological dysfunction. So there are some things we can do. Definitely reach out to us. We'd be happy to help you out with that. And I'm sorry you're going through that. Um, thank you for answering. Okay. Oops. Let's go over there. Can progesterone suppositories be taken rectally? Yes, they can be. Uh, I'm not sure why you would, but it can be done. Can I do exercise on those days like ovulation to implantation? Uh, everybody's keen on exercise right now. Um, we're all putting on COVID pounds. So yes, you can exercise between ovulation and implantation, but again, don't go crazy, like reasonable stuff, guys. Um, thanks so much for the answer. Can I direct referral to you or endo for endo cleanup surgery or have my clinic refer me to you for surgery? Uh, Destiny, yes, you can be referred to us for surgery. However, it takes forever to get into surgery. So if you're in the Windsor area, for sure, we'd be happy to help you. If you are not in the Windsor area, let me know where you are. Um, you can DM me on uh, Instagram and I will direct you to someone that I trust in your neck of the woods. Uh, Shannon, would a fresh day three transfer be something you would recommend for someone who has poor blast rate? One blast from 40 eggs? 14 fertilized in three retrievals. Wow. Um, Shannon, I would want to know why those results are the way they are. But yes, I would definitely recommend a day three transfer. The truth of day three versus day five, guys, is that we don't actually know if a day three embryo does better in you than it does in the lab. Uh, there's no question your body is much better suited to growing an embryo than our lab ever will be. It doesn't matter what I do to the lab, and we talked about this last week, I can make it the most perfect lab in the universe, and I think we have. I still can't make it better than your body is. I mean, your body has billions of processes going on to correct everything when it happens or adjust things and make little micro adjustments. We don't have that in a lab. We've got a couple of processes going on, temperature, pH, humidity, those sorts of things. So um, you know, uh, gas concentrations. You've got billions of proteins going up and down and sideways and all over the place trying to help that process out. So it is possible that for some people, day three embryos are better. A good friend of mine who's a brilliant, brilliant lady, Eve Feinberg, if you're in the Chicago area, don't go see anybody else. See Eve. She uh, and I had had a conversation about this a while back. And Eve said when she fails with day five, she turns to day three. And she's had successes where the day fives just didn't work. So yes, I would recommend you consider that. Um, you might want to freeze them at day three and transfer them at day three. Uh, it's not an unreasonable thing to do, but I would definitely want to know why you had those results. Because going from 40 eggs total to just one blast assist, there's got to be something wrong somewhere. And I would want to know what. Uh, what are the key blood tests you look at for female when assessing fertility? Um, so we want to know everything. So I want to know their hemoglobin, their ferritin, which is their iron, vitamin D, which is critical. You want to know all of their hormones, FSH, LH, TSH, prolactin. 
Uh, we look at testosterone, DHEA, DHEAS, those are important too. You need to look at their thyroid critically. We look at their actual thyroid antibodies, also very important. And then probably the most important one is their anti-malarian hormone level. It's not the be-all and end-all, but it is really important to know what their AMH level is because that's a reasonable surrogate of how they're going to do with stimulation. And it doesn't answer yes or no as far as getting pregnant is concerned, but it's really important to help reassure patients because some people come in very afraid, very nervous. Do I have enough time? Can I spend time trying something less expensive like IUI or do I need to jump into IVF? The AMH will help you make that decision. Again, it's not the be all and end all and I don't believe in using it to determine what we do, but we do use it to help guide us with what we do. Uh, those are the blood tests. Are WIUI is beneficial? No. Uh, six randomized controlled trials show no benefit to doing a double IUI. The only time we use it, and I only agree to this at the insistence of my team, is if the sperm count is really low, because there is some weak evidence that it may be useful there, and some people are just desperate to try, and we want to help facilitate their journey, but we basically charge next to nothing to do it because I don't know if it works. So I don't want to be charging people for stuff like can't even convince myself works. So we try and keep the price for that as low as possible. There are places um, that shall remain nameless uh, that charge an arm and a leg to do a double IUI, like $1,200, $900, $1,000, that kind of thing. Um, that's with OHIP funding here in Ontario. Uh, I think that's insane. There's absolutely zero justification for doing that, especially when there's no data to support that it is beneficial. So my advice to you would be only do it if it hasn't worked with a single after maybe two or three tries. And also make sure you're doing it somewhere where the cost is very low. Um, I will also say that uh, it's important to make sure that if you are doing a double IUI that they're doing the timing of it correctly for you because you don't want to have it like, you know, 72 hours later, it has to be within sort of a 36 hour window. So it's usually sort of 12 hours after you trigger and 36 hours or 24 and 36. Don't go too late with it or else it's probably extra useless. Live, love, fearless. Is there any way to improve egg quality prior to IUI or IVF? I have PCOS and we have male factor due. My husband going through cancer treatment. Oh, I'm so sorry. Taking CoQ10, anything else? Yes. So uh, lots of vitamins. Vitamin D, your prenatal vitamin, the fish oils, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, ferritin. Um, if you're PCO, you want to take NAC, NAC, and acetylcysteine. You want to take inositol, and you want to be taking um, coenzyme Q10, which you're already taking. So those are all really important. If weight is an issue, bring your weight down. That is a factor in egg quality. It's been demonstrated multiple times. So if you have PCOS, that's really important. Um, all of those things will contribute. No smoking, no drinking, no drug use. Uh, do everything you can to try and stay calm. All of those will help with your egg quality. Uh, Mercy. When to stop baby aspirin in IVF patients? Don't stop baby aspirin. Stay on it the whole pregnancy. Reduces preeclampsia, reduces preterm labor. Um, so stay on it. That's an easy one. Good question, guys. Uh, we're almost done. What age is considered advanced maternal age? Oh, you're going to hate me for answering this. I'm 31 and so sad that I'm old and will have only one abnormal embryos. Okay, so you're not old. You're 31. Um, almost Nobody coming for fertility treatment is old. Um, genuinely, I have only one patient I've ever considered old who is coming to us for fertility treatment. Everybody else is reasonable. And so at 31, you are definitely not old. Technically, advanced maternal age is over the age of 35, but we don't even get concerned about it till you're close to 39 or 40. So you're not even close. At 31, you're young. We use egg donors that are 31 years old. So you're not going to produce a lot of abnormal embryos. At 31, your embryo uh, abnormality rate is probably right around 30%, maybe 35 at the highest. So the likelihood is higher that you're producing normal embryos than that you're producing older embryos. Way back when on Instagram, one of my very first posts um, I said that I absolutely hate the term geriatric pregnancy. There is literally no such thing as a geriatric pregnancy. 
Geriatric is poorly defined in the literature, but it generally applies to people that are at least over the age of 65. I don't know of anybody over the age of 65 coming to us for pregnancy. We've had some that are close, but no one that is over the age of 65. So none of you are geriatric, and I hate that term. If somebody ever says geriatric pregnancy to you, just walk away from those people. That's just gonna mess with your mojo and no one should be messing with your mojo. So yeah, no geriatric pregnancies. And 31, you are hella young. You don't have anything to worry about. When a patient of yours has subchorionic hemorrhage, do you tell them to do strict, moderate, no bed rest? Yeah, I don't tell them to do strict bed rest unless it's a big bleed, like I can visually see that it's huge on ultrasound. Um, we do put them on progesterone if they're not already on it. We take them off of blood thinners like aspirin, heparin if they are on it. And I will tell them to rest if it's a bigger bleed. If it's not a bigger bleed, we just tell them to take it easy. So no heavy lifting, no straining. Unfortunately, no intercourse. Sorry to the guys that are watching and the ladies that enjoy it too. Um, we want you to take it reasonably easy. Don't go crazy. Kind of keep it reasonable. Um, I've recently heard about cervical stenosis. Yep. Can you explain what this is and how to fix it? How does it affect IUI and IVF? Okay, so cervical stenosis is when your cervix is really tight, so the sperm can't get into the cervix. It's the opening to your uterus. The uterus is like a heart-shaped balloon, and if the cervix is really tight at the bottom where the opening is, nothing can get in there. Uh, there's only two ways to do it or to, to bypass it. So you can either stretch it open with a dilation for which you need to be very, very sleepy or very, very stoned or asleep completely, or you do IUI or IVF, and we can usually get past it. I was just on the phone with some really special uh, people from Saskatchewan who came out to us. They tried IVF previously at another center. They could not get into their cervix, so they had embryos ready to go that they had thawed, which is awful because once you've thawed them, you don't want to refreeze them. They literally could not get into your cervix. So then they did something that I can't say I agree with the second time around. Uh, and then that didn't work either. And they had rethought another batch of embryos. So both times kind of a disaster. I brought her into Ontario. We took her to the OR. I dilated her cervix. Almost a year later, we transferred her recently. She's pregnant with twins. First try, no problems. I was just on the phone with them today. Um, hopefully they're watching and congratulations guys. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty easy thing to manage. You just have to be good at what you do and gentle. Um, not that the other place wasn't good, but you got to know the steps that you have to take and, you know, do it carefully and appropriately. Can a patient do something post-transfer to cause an embryo to not implant? Yes. Smoke, drink, or use drugs. Stress out of your mind. Jump on Google and check every single twitch, itch, lump, bump, and other thing that happens to you. Um, listen to your friends who know nothing about medicine or, or are telling you to try this, that, and the other thing, all of which is unscientific. Um, so don't do any of those things. Don't over-exercise. Don't strain. Um, stay out of the hot tub, extremes of heat, cold, that kind of thing. Yes to a prayer moment on our community here. I agree too. I think we should have a prayer moment. I'm going to set that up. Uh, we're all going to say prayer. There's a great prayer I know that I will happily read to all of you uh, for expectant mothers. I just sent it to one of my uh, patients recently. Uh, what vitamin levels should I ensure are normal before my transfer? D, uh, ferritin um, are the most amazing, are most important ones. And um, the rest of them are not quite as important, but D and ferritin are important. So that's your iron level and your vitamin D. Uh, we don't really get you to check the other ones. You can check your B12 as well. Just make sure you're taking lots of vitamins. That's the important part. Is melatonin okay to use after embryo transfer? Yes, stay on your melatonin. Super important. Shows an increase in success. I think I'm hopeless with another baby. You're never hopeless. There's always a chance. Does taking my fertility pills and vitamins with a liquid other than water lower the efficacy of the absorption level? Wow, uh, it can. It depends on what you're taking it with and if that interacts with what the vitamin is. Um, I would just stick with water for that one. Uh, that'll make it easier. How much time we got? 8.59. Okay, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your questions. I know you guys on Instagram ask lots. I apologize. 
reach out to us um, on uh, Instagram. I do try and get back to people. People contact me every day and I'm answering their questions. So don't hesitate, I'll do my best. Uh, watch our YouTube videos, make sure you uh, like, comment and subscribe. And we will see you again next week. I'm hoping to look at whether chocolate impacts fertility, but it's a tough topic to check out. So have a great day, guys, and stay safe, please. Everybody stay safe. God bless you all. I'll set up a prayer thing for all of us. We can all take a moment and say a prayer for one another. Stay well, guys. Have a good night. Bye now.